What's going on, podcast listeners? My name is Michael Chernow. I am a restaurateur and lifestyle entrepreneur, and I am truly obsessed with living a life better than yesterday through wellness, fitness, and good vibes. I've always wondered if the drive to succeed is something we are born with or if it's something that is made over time through grit, drive, and perseverance. I get to answer that question exactly, and the goal of this podcast is to talk with people that have absolutely crushed it in life and have inspired me to do the same. This is Born or Made. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Born or Made podcast. I have a really interesting guest on today. His name is Stephen Himmel. Uh, he is a partner at Ventera Capital, which is a New York-based VC fund investing in really, really cool brands, a lot of which I'm sure you know, brands like Hugh Kitchen and Quip and Felix and Gray and a few others that I'm sure we'll get into. Um, Steven is also a, an artist. He makes really cool pieces of art um, using basketball hoops and other things that he finds and collects uh, throughout the city. It's definitely got some urban elements to it. You should definitely check him out. His, his artist uh, sort of AKA is at Himsey on Instagram, but I'm really fired up to talk to Steven today, predominantly about the world of venture capitalists or venture capital, really dig into what a VC fund looks for in entrepreneurs and emerging brands. And I, I think it's just gonna be a super informative conversation. So ladies and gents, welcome to the show, Steven Himmel. What's up, man? How you doing, Mr. C? <laughs> yes. Uh, so, you know, I, typically the way this show goes is we walk through uh, the guest story. I, mm. I, I would really love to understand who you are, why you are who you are, how you came to be who you are, and, le and, and then ask the question at the very end of the show, do you think you were born with an inherent ability to crush it in life the way you have or if you were made over time? But... Let's start with an introduction from you. Tell us who you are and how you ended up here. Awesome. Well, before I start with that, I, I want to thank you just given your involvement with some amazing restaurants in the city. Your concepts have you know, fed me over the years, starting with Meatball Shop to, to Seymour's. So I, uh, I've been a big fan of what you've done over the years. So I appreciate all that. And you've definitely been part of an amazing kind of restaurant wave here in New York, which is you know, a cultural center. Uh, globally. So um, personal background, I grew up in Akron, Ohio. And if you know anybody from Ohio, our roots run very deep. And that's one of the first things we always lead with. So um, shout out to LeBron James, shout out to the Black uh -huh. Keys, you know, some some great athletes, some great musicians, and uh, I humbly say some decent investors that they came out of Akron as well. So um, that was a you know great experience growing up in the Midwest, a very kind of culturally diverse town, Akron, in really um, you know a part of the country that outside of major cities is is pretty rural. So I uh, I graduated, stayed in the Midwest through college, graduated from the University of Michigan, did an undergraduate business program there, which at the time was a I think like a top two or three program. It was always kind of interested in finance and investing, so. Um, when I went to university, you know, lost a couple of friends kind of with the Ohio State Michigan rivalry. They, you know, kind of told me I went to the dark side and uh, never really looked back. I'm still friends with them, but I kind of just, I rode the Michigan wave all the way to New York City. So I moved out here in 2006, started my career in investment banking, which for anyone who's looking into kind of getting into the investment world is, is really a great starting point. You know, you just learn a lot of basics, everything from you know, proper communication to really staying on top of a schedule, multitasking, um, dealing with deadlines, dealing in a, you know, working in a very stressful and intense environment. And I think that those are skills that you can apply to anything down the line. So that was an amazing experience for me. I did that for about three years. And as you mentioned, uh, joined a firm and it was just launching called Vantara Capital, which I've been with for the majority of my career. So I've been at Vantara for 12 years now. Um, you know, Vantara is a private equity firm 
we operate primarily with high net worth individuals, family offices, you know, folks that have made their money in, in one industry or another that are really interesting, you know, very smart, very sophisticated investors and, and highly collaborative. So it's been an amazing experience for me just to see, you know, a number of interesting opportunities within the investment landscape, not only within venture, but also, you know, private equity credit, you name it. So Right now, my day to day is really focused on a venture fund that we launched a couple of years ago called the Ventera Accelerator Fund, which is focused on investing in consumer and consumer tech opportunities. Um, and there's a couple of really interesting angles that we can get into that as well, but I'll stop there. Awesome, man. Uh, you know, I, I think it would be awesome to break down a few things. One, for people that are listening that don't really have an understanding of what a venture capital fund is, I would love to for you to break that down. I would also love for you to distinguish the difference between a venture capital fund and a private equity fund. Also, yes, literally mm -hmm. like how how they how they're made up, the difference between those and an investment bank. Mm -hmm. how, let let's just start there because I think that 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 that's a, that could be really helpful for people. Sure. Yeah. So so high level think about. If there's a, uh, uh, an entrepreneur or a founder of a business is looking to sell their company to somebody else, there's typically an intermediary, essentially a broker, and that broker is an investment bank. So that investment bank is what you would call the sell side. They're the exact same what you would see in terms of brokers selling real estate. If you have someone that owns a place looking to get out of it, they do the exact same thing with companies. So investment banking is really just kind of the, the intermediary to a number of transactions, whether that's in venture capital or private equity. So venture capital and private equity are both what you would call the buy side. And there's a lot of similarities between the two, but there's also a lot of differences. So venture capital um, in, in very simplistic terms is essentially, if you have an idea or a concept that you wanna to take to market, you wanna build a business around, but you don't necessarily have the money to do that, you go to a venture capitalist who has the money, but don't, doesn't necessarily have the idea or the interest in building that business. And it's essentially a marriage. So you go around, you put together an investment presentation, you pitch a number of different VCs in, with the hopes that ultimately you'll find one that you kind of jibe with, that believes in your vision, and it's willing to provide you capital at a certain price and work with them to basically scale that company. Private equity is a little bit different in the sense that the life cycle of a business and private equity is a little bit later stage. So whereas venture is really just about businesses kind of just getting off the ground, private equity is really about mature, typically cash flowing companies that maybe have been around for 15, 20, 50, maybe even 100 years. Um, a lot of them are larger checks. So, you know, we're talking about the Blackstones of the world that are doing 100, 200, 300 million dollar deals venture deals tend to be a little bit smaller in terms of the check size that you put into those opportunities. And how, how are these companies organized? The money comes from who? So the, in terms of venture? In terms of venture funds, the, the money tends to, to come gotcha. from. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so, so venture, so venture and private equity are, are both typically set up in, in the same light. So what happens is I'm a venture capitalist. I go out to my network of high net worth individuals, you know, wealthy families, large institutions. I mean, even institutions like a, a pension fund or an employee retirement system. And I say, listen, you guys have cash that you basically need to generate a return on. And you need to generate a return on that cash because at some point that cash is going to be dished out to the individuals that retired that are looking for their pension check or you're just simply looking to grow your own balance sheet your own capital so give me a portion of that you know and i'll basically invest it on your behalf and then those investments that make money it's typically structured where the venture capital firm or the private equity firm will take what's called a carry or a performance fee. So if you make uh, an investment in a, in a deal, it does 2X or 5X, the venture capital uh, firm or the private equity firm would keep a percentage of the profits and the majority of their profits would go back to our clients. And, and private equity is, it works the same way. 
private equity works the exact same way. Yeah, exactly. So the interesting thing about the investment world that a lot of people don't necessarily realize is, you know, there's there's teachers in the Ohio, you know, uh, pension fund that have been working, you know, fifth grade chemistry, whatever math for the last 50 years of their life. And at some point they're going to get a check because they were in the system for 30 years. The check that they receive is is largely driven off of the returns that the managers that manage the capital in that retirement fund are able to generate. So venture capital, private equity is just one asset class that those individuals responsible for ultimately paying those checks out to retirees um, to generate returns. So venture capital, private equity, real estate, public investing, these are all just different slivers within the investment world. Cool. I, I appreciate the breakdown. I think it's a great way to start the conversation because uh, I think a lot, you know, a lot of people out there don't really understand the way the investment world works um, and don't really mm -hmm. know what a venture capitalist fund is or a venture fund is. So I think sure. sort of distinguishing what they are is, is, is super helpful. I can only imagine that you've been pitched thousands of times. I mean, you've been at the fund for 12 years. That's a long time to be at a fund. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're a partner there. So I would imagine that you, that, that most pitches you end up being a part of or see. Yep. What do you look for when somebody walks into a room, when an entrepreneur walks into the room, forgetting about the business that they're, that they're pitching? Is there any, are there any characteristics that you look for in the individual that you're able to really pinpoint as someone that has it or doesn't? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's funny. I mean, a, a lot of the skill set that you use in initial introductory meetings is really just for me based around intuition. You know, you kind of got to go back to that spider sense and you have to go back to that, you know, experience that you've had in dealing with hundreds of thousands of people over the course of your life and letting your intuition really tell you, do I think that this person is being, you know, um, upfront with us? Do I have a good feeling for what they're trying to build? Do I see the passion coming through in the conversation? So a lot of it is really just around, do I like the individual? And do I feel like this is someone that I really want to essentially, you know, form a five, 10 year partnership with? Because once I make that investment into a company and I back an entrepreneur, I'm there for the long term. It's not like if things you know, aren't working out one day, I can't necessarily call them up and say, hey, you know, can I have my money back kind of thing. I'm there with them, whether things are going poorly or whether things are going really well. So I think first and foremost, you just have to really kind of get a feel for the individual and make sure that you like them and, and feel the passion that they're willing to build the next great business. When you sit down with an entrepreneur, typically the entrepreneur that walks into a, a pitch meeting is the visionary, right? Would you say that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they, they have to be the person who, you know, has the grand, you know, has the grand plan. I would say that it's usually not just one individual, though. There's usually two, three people at the table. Because to, you know, to launch an early stage business and venture, takes a lot of different skill sets. You need to have someone who is creative, who understands the marketing side of the equation. You need to have someone who's a little bit more process oriented, who can kind of handle, you know, the books, make sure the financials are right. You need to have someone who's forward facing, who's comfortable raising capital, who's comfortable, you know, being on commercials, that type of thing. So it's usually a team effort. It's rarely a situation where I walk into a meeting, it's just one individual. That, that is so helpful, man. I, I, you know, I mean, I have my own experience in, in, in pitching, <laughs> you know, I've launched a number of businesses and I've certainly had my own experience. And I actually did a VC tour, you know, pre pandemic, probably let's see March. It was probably spring of 2019. No, no, no. Let's see spring of, it was like, it was like 10 months ago. Uh, you know, and I took all the pitch meetings myself. And so yeah. I, I was armed with as much content as possible. But I will say 
that it's rare that you find an entrepreneur or an individual that is really good at the vision or really understands the full like 30,000 feet view of the business, really good at the marketing and also really good at the financials. It, it's just, it, it, it's, a, it's a, and I think that that's really important to say here, especially from someone like you who is actually arming entrepreneurs with funds to go out and build. Mm -hmm. Because do you, would you say that that if there's somebody that that you meet that is 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 uh, you know comes off as good at everything, there's there's a bit of a red flag there. Um, no, I, it's it's not an instant red flag, but I, I I would say that there's a high correlation between some of those individuals that come off as being good at everything and, and potentially overconfidence and and possibly a little bit of cockiness. Um, which you have to be wary of. I think that as an entrepreneur, it's great to be confident and you have to be a risk taker. And those are paramount in building your company, but you also have to be willing to listen and willing to accept the fact that you're going to make mistakes and you cannot be the master of all. It's very, very difficult. So I would say there's a high correlation between folks that think they know it all and could potentially be difficult to work with. I'm sorry for all the questions, but I, I think that this is oh, such good. a great opportunity to, to, to really dive into your head because yeah. so many people, I mean, right now, obviously there's a lot going on in the world. A lot of people are unemployed. I mean, it's coming back, but there's still millions of people in the country that are unemployed. And mm -hmm. now more so than ever, I would say entrepreneurialism or that entrepreneurial lifestyle is something that a lot of people are after. And so people are pivoting and they're going from paid employees to entrepreneurs. I think it's wonderful. Are there mm -hmm. characteristics that you have been able to identify from the successful entrepreneurs that you've worked with? Are there any sort of common threads across the successful entrepreneurs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I'll I was thinking about this a little bit before we hopped on here and I'll, I'll kind of give a few examples. So the first one might not be that obvious, but I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. And it's actually sense of humor. And the reason why I say that is because individuals with a really good sense of humor typically have a really high EQ, emotional quotient. And they're able to connect with people. They know what's funny, they know how to kind of get a rise and how to catch someone's attention. And they're able to basically communicate and relate to those individuals in a really impressive way. And for me, most of you know my focus is within the consumer and consumer tech space. And so nothing is more important in terms of being able to communicate with your customer, to engage them and to make things kind of fun and create that kind of community aspect. And one of, uh, one of the CEOs in our portfolio, which I think very highly of is Matt Scanlon, who's the CEO of Nottam Cashmere. Um, just quick plug here. This is their cashmere sweater. I'm wearing $75, like smooth as butter all day. I uh, want one of those. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll send you a couple. They're the best. Uh, he does a really good job. And you just see that sense of humor coming through all of his creative and all of his marketing materials. You see, you know, he's done some really great campaigns here in New York City. Um, and again, it just kind of creates that community connection with their with their customer base, I think is just paramount to building a, a great brand. Um, second is creativity along those lines of sense of humor, folks that really understand how to kind of stick out from the crowd, whether that's uh, product development in building something that's just different than everything else that's on shelf or communicating why your product is different in a way that's kind of new. Um, and I think, you know, someone in our portfolio that's done a great job with that is Simon over at Quip Toothbrushes. They've, you know, built uh, a toothbrush that looks like it belongs in the Apple store. Um, you know, some of their product development looks like it's, you know, coming from like NASA, that type of thing. They've, they've been able to take, you know, a product category, which is oral care and very kind of just, you know, no one really wants to deal with it. No one likes going to the dentist three months a year, let's be honest. Um, and they've kind of made it fun. Um, they've made it cool. And I think that that's really important as well. Um, I could go all on day, uh, uh, go, um, go all, you know, um, 
let's see what else here. Uh, perseverance. Um, Paravel is a business that we backed and it's a luxury uh, accessories for travel. So obviously everything that's gone on with COVID, you know, the world shut down, airports shut down for, you know, four or five months and their ability to persevere through a difficult time like this really kind of is something that you want to see in entrepreneurs. There's rarely a time when things are always going to go well. You're going to have to pivot a couple of times. You know, you're going to have to hunker down and really figure out how can we minimize cash burn or, or what can we do to continue to build this company. It's going to be tough and you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and get dirty. And I think that they're doing a great job of that. So, you know, perseverance is another one that's huge. Um, empathy, just, you know, from a team leadership standpoint, uh, being empathetic and being able to relate to the people that work for you and, you know, giving them um, credit where credit's due and working with them hand in hand and realizing that even though you're the founder of the company, it should be, you know, a flat hierarchy and everybody should be on the same uh, level playing field. I think it's huge. Um, and then finally, stewardship. I think that, you know, for us, we're investing capital in these companies and, and they need to be a steward of venture capital funds, whether it's ours or someone else's money, and just being able to really identify and, and quantify risk in a way that is um, acting as a steward for the business is huge. So those are the ones I think are really the most common. That is so awesome to hear that. Cool. I, I, I think... I believe that at my core as well. I, I believe that, you know, you, you kind of, I think there's two kinds of leaders, right? There, there are the leaders that are kind of scary. They're like, the, there are the bosses and then there are the leaders. And, and that's sort of how I, how I delineate the two. The bosses mm -hmm. are scary right they 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 tend to they tend to wear the boss patch on their sleeve um and when they walk into the room uh, most people you know sort of perk up i just don't in my from my experience i don't think the bosses unless you're in the military have a really long shelf life with a with a group of people um the leaders from my experience are the ones that their people actually love like the people love the leader they Absolutely. they, they, they want to follow the leader into the battlefield they mm -hmm. really do there's nothing out of spite they don't roll their eyes when when you know the leader walks in or out of the room and so i i i, I think it's great that you point out sort of the more emotionally intelligent qualities that make a great entrepreneur how important do you think EQ is in today's landscape? And when I say EQ for anybody that's listening that doesn't know what EQ is, it's really emotional intelligence, the ability to uh, communicate well with others and somewhat be a chameleon uh, and adapt to most any situation in a verbal way uh, and, and genuinely want to listen to people as opposed to just wait to speak. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I I think it's more important than IQ, to be honest with you. I think, you know, in today's world where you can outsource so many critical functions, whether it's on the marketing side, creative or performance marketing, you know, outsourcing the product and who manufactures it, outsourcing even before manufacturing the R&D and product development, just being able to work with people, in my mind, is far more important than being a genius. Um, I think ultimately, you know, hiring well is one of the kind of key ingredients to building a great business as well. I think Michael Dell said it that, you know, he doesn't actually want to be the smartest person in his business or in his family office. He wants to hire people that are a lot smarter than him that can push the ball forward. So yeah, it's it's um it's pretty much everything. I mean, we we see it across the landscape all the time. You know, companies that we've passed on, you know, maybe because we were a little bit concerned about the entrepreneur in terms of how we would be able to work with them and in that partnership. And ultimately, I think that our our intuition, you know, proves correct more times than not. How many pitches do you see a month? I think last year we saw about a thousand. 
So, I mean, you're talking maybe 80 a month kind of thing. So on average, you know, two, sometimes three a day. Uh, wow. So yeah, it's, it's all, it's all the time. I mean, just now being on here for 20 minutes or so, I probably got five or six more emails. I got to get to at some point. <laughs> That, I mean, that's wild. I, I, I feel like you, you've got such a cool job because you get to see, you really get to see creativity in its infancy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. And it's funny. I mean, it's, you know, just sometimes my parents ask me, you know, well, what exactly you do on a day-to-day -day basis? I'm like, well, just, you know, turn on Shark Tank. And that's, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, that, that takes up about half my day. And so, you know, fortunate to be in a position where you know meeting with interesting founders all the time really cool companies and you know this is a way for me to be involved in the world and hopefully you know back the, the brands the products that i think are going to make the world a better place one of the you know coming back to ventera a little bit one of the things that we focus on within the venture fund is what we call esy investing so that's better for the environment, better for society, better for you. So in the early stage companies that we partner with, we're really looking for at least one of those elements. And so, you know, environmental um, sustainability, you know, I personally am not a consumer of, um, you know, single use plastic. It's something that I really do not want to invest in that category. Uh, socially responsible is, you know, a category I think is really important in terms of making sure that you have fair trade practices, give back programs. You're really thinking about your mission statement as a business and what you want to build for the future. And then better for you is really just about the health and wellness trend that we're seeing all over the place. So not just within, you know, vitamin mineral supplements, but, you know, food and beverage in general, I think consumers are becoming so much more um, informed in terms of what, th what they're putting in their bodies, where the product is sourced from, you know, it's really a huge wave and I don't think it's going to change anytime soon, which, you know, really allows our firm to be positioned, you know, in a, in a really good place to capitalize on some of these things as we see them come through the door. Yeah, you know, you, you said trend, you said health and wellness trend. And I'm, I'm wondering if you all on, on your side of the street actually see this as a trend or do you see this as a new way of life? I see the wellness the, the uptick in wellness and the trajectory, it's obviously grown exponentially over the last decade. I personally don't see any end in sight. If anything, I actually see it, it, it growing in perpetuity. Uh, I, I just, I, I don't see this as a trend. Yeah, agree. I would say fad is what I would use in terms of if, if it's something that maybe would just be temporary. I see it as a so called a long term trend, maybe to clarify that. And it's you know really a wave, a tidal wave, whatever you want to call it. I mean, this is something that I agree with you 100 percent is is here to stay. Um, we're only going to see, you know, products on shelf become healthier. Um, you know, we can talk about that a bit just in terms of, you know, the, the different things that we're seeing, which I, I love to see both as an investor and obviously as a consumer. Yeah, tell um, us what you're seeing. I wanna know what you're seeing in the world of wellness. I think that's really cool. Yeah, so you know, specifically within food and beverage, you know, I think that there's a, a number of kind of areas that are, are gonna become more and more part of the conversation. Um, and the first is probably sugar. So for anyone that you know, drinks whatever, Coca-Cola or doesn't look at the label, you know, you're consuming 20, 30, potentially 40 grams um, in a bottle. Uh, sugar is, is everywhere. It's in bread, um, it's in sauce, it's in things that you would never think of. And, you know, it's just so harm, harmful for your body from an inflammation standpoint, um, from an obesity standpoint. And, you know, the conversation now is more important than ever, just given what we're going through with COVID and, you know, there's clear similarities between what you consume in your body, ultimately how your body ends up wearing that consumption and how that puts you at risk for this virus. So, you know, there's some silver linings in terms of what we're going through right now. I think that, you know, alternative sweeteners is going to be something that people are going to see more and more of, you know, and some of those are monk fruit, uh, stevia, allulose, there's a bunch of them and none of them are, are perfect. 
but I think when used in combination, you can see some really interesting formulations that will ultimately replace sugar and just going to make products so much healthier. Um, another trend that I think is really- Wait, I want to talk about that one for a second, because I think that's very important. I, 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 I the, the sugar is sort of uh, the, the alternative sugar arena is definitely something that I'm very much interested in. Yeah. Uh, monk fruit and stevia probably being the two at the top of the chain there. Have you mm -hmm. noticed any brands leaning more towards either monk fruit or stevia, or is it sort of right down the center? What, what's the feedback in general? Um, I think so personally for me, I, I like stevia a little bit better. I think there's less of an aftertaste. I think the, one of the big issues with alternative sweeteners is really just the aftertaste. You see that with monk fruit. Um, you see that a little bit with allulose. The other issue is digestive. So some people just don't digest, you know, allulose or, or monk fruit or some of these others, um, as well as natural kind of cane sugar. So that's something that's really going to be unique to every individual. And you really just have to see what's right for you. Um, you know, one of the products that we're investors in, Quick Plug, Hue Chocolate, unbelievable. No refined sugar, no cane sugar. You know, they use coconut sugar and it's a little bit lower glycemic, um, which again, it's not great for you, but it's not as bad as going buying a Snickers, that type of thing. So I've just got to say real quick, Hue Kitchen, is by far one of my favorite brands, period. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm like a massive fan of Hue Kitchen. I always have the Hue Kitchen bars and the chocolate covered almonds. I noticed recently, I was actually gonna reach out to the founder just to ask him why, but I noticed that the, the packaging has recently changed. And also on, on the, on the uh, chocolate covered almonds and also the almonds used to have like a little bit of like a, it, it, it felt like there was like a powdered cacao on the almond and now there's no longer a powdered cacao. It's more, it's smoother. It's not shiny because they, they're very, they're very uh, diligent about the no shine. Um, but so did you guys all make a decision together to, to, to sort of change some things up with you? Yeah, they're, they're always iterating. I mean, the, the, the advantage that those guys had when they launched their business. So Q kitchen, down over by NYU was their basically first foray into healthy, fast, casual eating. And that really provided the founders of Hue product, which is the chocolate and the, the almond, the chocolate covered almonds, and now getting into crackers and a number of other categories. The kitchen really was a crutch. It allowed them to basically di test different products that they thought was interesting personally, but they weren't sure how the market would react to it. They had this shelf space in the restaurants. They said, Let's just make our own Hue product branded stuff. We'll sell it on shelf. We'll see how it sells. That those products became so successful, starting initially with the chocolate bar and, and then into the chocolate covered almonds, et cetera, that they actually focused, they they shifted the they shifted the entire focus of the business. They actually closed Hue Kitchen here in New York City. And now it's purely just a CPG business. So that kind of goes to show you the opportunity and really a kind of a creative business model in terms of how they were able to launch that brand. Uh, but, you know, to answer your question, those guys are constantly iterating. They have a whole list of products or ingredients rather that they will not use, you know, starting with some of the oils, whether it's palm oil or safflower oil or some of the emulsifiers. Obviously, we talked about sugar. Um, so you know, I would say that they're definitely uh, a leader in the category in terms of clean label, clean ingredients. Um, and you're going to see a lot more of these businesses. But, you know, the, the trick is marrying products that people actually want to eat that taste good, that are fun, that are also not terrible for you. Yeah. What, what do you what do you think of, you know, using sort of unrefined sugar, sort of like a coconut or a maple sugar in comparison to a stevia or monk fruit? I, I personally would go with stevia or monk fruit. Um, I think that, you know, what's most important is the glycemic index reaction. Mm. And this might be a tough one to explain to the viewers, but in a nutshell, every food that you consume 
essentially has a rating on a glycemic index. And that glycemic index, I'll try not to butcher this, uh, essentially measures how your body reacts to um, digesting that food. So higher sugar foods with no fiber really spike your uh, blood sugar levels. And as a result, your body has to essentially release insulin to reduce those levels. And that puts a lot of stress on your system. So ultimately the goal is, and you see this with the keto crowd and everything is to, to focus on foods that are lower glycemic index that don't cause as much stress on your body that allow your body to not work as hard to digest. And so for me, I'm more focused on that glycemic index where you have um, some of the alternative sweeteners really not being absorbed into your bloodstream and ultimately are lower a rating versus your traditional unprocessed sugars. Great. Sorry for, for uh, going off the rails there for a minute. I hope that wasn't too technical. I would say that if anyone's interested in it, just Google around. There's plenty of information out there. But I think that, you know, as consumers become more and more informed in terms of what they're putting in their body, you know, the conversation around sugar, it's becoming a little bit more prevalent. Um, but I think next, you know, in the next five years or so, the conversation around glycemic index and consumers really understanding how that affects their body is going to become kind of part of the conversation as well. Yeah, I mean, if you if you think about the the diabetes, uh, autoimmune disease, right, they have an insulin deficiency. So when their blood sugar spikes, their body does not actually produce the insulin that it needs to bring down that blood sugar, ultimately creating inflammation across every single region in their body, right? My father mm -hmm. was a was a type one diabetic. And if his blood sugar was high, he would go into shock and yeah. his body would shut down. And so, you know, if he, if he was, if he didn't have the, the right amount of insulin in him, in him, so he would inject insulin all the time to just manage those, manage those things. But I think it's really interesting, uh, you know, the, the sugar conversation because uh, sugar is, is ultimately so unbelievably delicious. And it's yeah. such a, it's such a shame that it's also so incredibly bad for us and at, 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 you know at a yeah. large at large quantities it, um, it is, what a, yeah. yeah just just to throw in one other point there you know it's it's tough because there are ways to consume sugar in healthy ways i don't, I don't want to kind of mis, misdirect anyone listening to this you know for example a, a buddy of mine jesse itzler um he he promotes uh, this lifestyle of only eating fruit until noon. So he consumes, you know, bananas, any type of fruit under the sun up until noon. And his thought is that even though these fruits have a lot of sugar, they also have tons of fiber, which helps digest that sugar in a healthier way. And obviously tons of nutrients. So if you're consuming sugar, that's empty calories that, you know, are, you know, not part of a healthy diet with no other nutrients or fiber attached to it, that's certainly a lot um, more uh, detrimental to your system. Yeah. And, and then one other thing to note just on that topic is the, uh, if you're a very active person, uh, carbohydrates are, if you're looking to grow in, in any way, muscular, like if you're looking to grow muscularly, it's very difficult to do that without the help of carbohydrates. Your muscles need glycogen to burn in order to grow. And then you need to feed your muscles glycogen in order to recover, right? If you're an active person. So I always say, I, you know, I've, I've, I've done keto for long stints of time. I pretty much live the paleo lifestyle. I really enjoy the paleo lifestyle. I don't even call it a diet because I think it is just a way of life when you're eating real whole foods. Yep. Um, However, there are a few things that I do use uh, that would not be approved on the paleo plan, which is oats. I'm a massive fan of oats. I think oats um, eaten at the right time uh, are, 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 are really beneficial as well as sweet potatoes. Um, mm -hmm. So those are those uh, ultimately all carbohydrates that you put into your body metabolize as sugar and your body either uses them or they get stored as fat. And that is that is ultimately the breakdown of how the sugar game works. Um, yeah. 
And so anybody who's listening, you know, I don't think sugar is necessarily the devil, but I would just suggest that if you need sugar to fuel your fire, know when to take it and what kind of sugar to take. Empty sugar calories, like, you know, like you said, Snickers bar is never going to do your body justice, period. It's just not right. Like maybe if you've just run a marathon and you want to eat a Snickers bar, your body's going to consume that in, in seconds. So it's mm -hmm. not going to, it's not going to penetrate you in a negative way. Um, that said, you know, I, I always like to say, fuel your fire with the right stuff at the right time. And, you know, I, yep. I just, I think that that is the most important uh, sort of philosophy to, to, to stick to. What other yeah. trends are you seeing in the, uh, in, the, in the consumer space? Yeah, so I think, you know, plant-based meat is gonna continue to be a big one. Obviously, you know, um, Impossible Burger was a huge hit and there's uh, a number of different categories I feel like plant-based can disrupt. They obviously started with red meat. We're seeing some interesting ones in kind of the chicken space. There's a, a cool startup called Nugs, which makes amazing chicken nuggets that are uh, all plant-based. Um, there's some interesting companies in the seafood space that are going to be plant-based as well. They're creating product around different types of beans that, you know, replicate the, the taste and texture of fish. It's funny because, you know, even if you eat uh, seafood, if you're a pescatarian, you know, there's still risks associated with that, whether you're eating, you know, wild or farmed fish, you know, the issue of microplastics is now becoming a thing within seafood. So, um, you know, the prolifer proliferation of plastic that we have in our system is now seeping its way into the seafood supply chain, which ultimately comes back to us when we eat that seafood. So, you know, plant-based is going to become, going to continue to be a huge trend. I think we'll see some interesting ones in the seafood category in the next year or two. Um, outside of that, you know, clean labels really just, again, kind of a reduction in some of these emulsifiers, preservatives. I think a lot of the oils that are used in a lot of these products, uh, people are going to realize are, are harmful and they're just, you know, they, they create a lot of inflammation in our bodies and they're just not healthy. And I mean, that's they're also not good for the environment. You know, palm oil is obviously very destructive to the environment. Um, you know, safflower oil, some of the sunflower oils. Uh, there's a couple of companies out there I think Siete is one, a couple other chip companies that use avocado oil, uh, which I prefer, which is I feel like a little bit easier on my body to digest. So some of the stuff in the oil category, I think people are going to become hip to as well. Wow, man, there's so many things happening in a really positive way. And it's so good to hear that, that you know, there, there are people like you guys that are really paying attention to it. If you're paying attention to it, it ultimately means that other people are paying attention to it, and that's such good news all all around. I want to yeah. I want to talk about your uh, your your career as an artist as well. I think it's really interesting that um, first of all, you got to check out uh, Stephen's Instagram handle at himsey h i m m s e y. Uh, he is making some really really cool pieces that are one of one, right? Every piece yep. is, is one of one. So why don't you talk to us about that? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, art has kind of been a part of my family for a while. My mom's actually a calligrapher uh, on my dad's side. His grandpa was an artist. So it's, it's kind of a little bit in the DNA. Um, and, you know, being in finance for almost 15 years now, it's a very right side of the brain type career. And what I mean by that, it's really more revolves around, you know, working with numbers, analytical, it's very process oriented, working, you know, pushing a lot of paper. It's a grind. I'm not going to lie to anyone who's looking to get into the space. It's tough. And a lot of times you lose sight of, you know, the creative side of a business or just, you know, what's going on in the marketing side. So art for me was something that I kind of grew up around. So it's always been a passion of mine. And um, essentially what happened was I started going to, you know, just really interesting. This is back in the day. This is probably 2008, 2009. There were some really interesting flea markets over in Chelsea, a couple on the Upper West Side. And I saw these, you know, very beautiful ornate frames. And I was just kind of thinking, you know, what could I do with these to make a piece of artwork out of it? Obviously, you know, having grown up in somewhat of a basketball town, you know, watching LeBron since he was in eighth grade, have been a big fan of the sport forever. Um, 
and kind of came up with this idea of using the frame um, as the central focus of the piece of art. Obviously, frames are typically afterthoughts. You know, they just, you know, frame what's in the middle of the painting, and, and that's typically uh, what people are looking at. But this kind of flipped it, so it made the frame the focus. Uh, and so essentially what I did was I just started constructing these miniature basketball hoops out of these vintage ornate uh, frames. Um, they're typically about three, three feet tall by four feet wide. Um, the backboards are typically made from a piece of porcelain or acrylic glass and all different kind of styles to them. So artwork for me has been a great you know, part of my just experience living in New York City and really allowed me to access more of the left side of my brain, which is the creative part, and really gave me a good perspective on how companies are marketing, how they're using creative, how they're thinking about positioning their product in a market. And so I think there's been some nice kind of accretive skill sets that I've been able to apply to venture through the art world, which most people wouldn't kind of consider. It's, it's rare that you meet a guy who's using vintage frames and building miniature basketball hoops uh, as, his, as his hobby and his main hustle is, is venture, <laughs> venture funding. Uh, so I think that the, the, the dichotomy there is, is incredible. Um, yeah. I, I'd like to ask you a few final questions. If sure. there's a piece of advice that was either given to you or a piece of advice that you just simply like to give to others that are trying to be the best version of themselves, how would you like us to leave this podcast? Or what kind of advice would you, would you ask us to leave this podcast with? Uh, things that have served me well living in New York City for 15 years, um, I would say be nice to everybody. Uh, don't be afraid to say sorry, admit mistakes. Everybody makes them. It's okay. Um, uh, continue to put yourself in the circle of opportunity. So there's so many interesting people that you're going to come across in New York City and everybody has something going on. Everybody is ambitious. Everybody has a dream that's living here. And if you have your own dream, if you have your own goals, make sure that you're putting yourself in position to achieve those. And, you know, it's a function of, of time and skill set. And ultimately, if you put yourself in the area of where you think, you know, the people are going that you want to go um, and you're smart about it and you're a decent human being, I think there's a good chance ultimately that'll get you to, to where you want to be and help you achieve your goals. It's beautiful, man. Um, last question. Sure. Do you think you were born with an inherent ability to get to where you're at today? Or do you think you were made over time? Um, definitely made over time. I would say that if it's like a nature versus nurture type of question, I would say you know, 20% nature, 80% nurture. Um, I think everybody has, you know, the skill set or at least the, the genetic disposition, um, whether that's mental or physical to be great. It's really just a function of how you develop that over time. And that, that starts at a very, very early age. You know, I feel, I feel fortunate that I grew up in a town again, that was, you know, very diverse. I went to a public high school. It was, you know, 50% African American, 50% white. Um, there was low income. There was upper, you know, upper class, uh, you know, kids that went to my school. And I think it really gave me a leg up in terms of being comfortable dealing with someone from all, from any type of background. And, you know, if you're in New York City, you're going to have to deal with people from all around the world that have different views, different beliefs in you and being comfortable in working with them is paramount. So, um, I think it's more about nurture than nature for sure. All right. And one last thing. Sure. So I'm developing a business called Creatures of Habit. I believe at my core that who we are today and who we were yesterday and who we dream of being tomorrow is all based on our habits, period, and done. That's my belief. Mm -hmm. Are there any habits that you do on a consistent basis that you're conscious of 
that you can share with us that make you a better version of yourself or make you the version of yourself that you only dream of being? Hmm, that's a tough question. Um, uh, ask me that one more time. <laughs> do, you, do you have any habits that you do on a daily basis that help you be a better version of yourself? Read, read at least 30 minutes a day. I think that, you know, um, just being aware of what's going on in the world is huge. Um, working out, I think exercise for anybody, um, whether, you know, you're working 40 hours a week or a hundred hours a week, you can find 20 minutes a day just to work out. I think that does wonders for your system. You know, it just makes you feel good. It, it keeps your mind more aware. So I think getting in the habit of making sure that you're keeping your physical right is, is very important. Um, and then just, you know, checking in with, um, checking in with your family on a habitual basis, I think is very important. You know, a lot of people in New York city lose sight of where they came from and, you know, the values that you're taught at a very young age and, you know, reconnecting with your family, um, really allows you to kind of stay grounded and, um, you know, just stay the person that you, um, were when you were growing up. So I, I think that those are, you know, all things that I try to do on a daily basis. Wow. I love the reconnecting with your family or the connecting with your family. I think no one's ever said that uh, when I asked this question. That's such a good one. I spent, uh, I spent five months back home in the house that I grew up with. And so I, I went back, I went back to Ohio, like March 15th. My parents were giving me a hard time. You know, they're watching the news from Ohio. They're like, I think you should, I think it's time to get out of there. So I packed, uh, I packed up a small bag. It wasn't even a suitcase, brought like a pair of jeans and some couple of shirts went back to Ohio and I stayed there basically since Labor Day. And so, you know, I think that there's a lot of really great lessons everybody can take out of this year. This, you know, it's obviously been a, a very difficult time for a number of people, but, you know, I think there's a lot of silver linings to this whole thing. And I think at the end of the day, you know, we're all going to come out of this, uh, you know, stronger, better people and in a, in a better position. So um, I'm definitely taking 2020 with me into the future. Stephen Himmel, thank you so much, man. I really, really appreciate you taking the time. This was an awesome conversation. I don't cool. think I know that people are going to get an enormous amount of value here. So cool. I appreciate it. I'm going to be knocking yeah. on your door as soon as I'm ready to pitch my new project. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the future, man. Thank you so, awesome. so much. Yeah. Let's grab, let's grab dinner at Meatball Shop, shop sometime. I'm, I'm around. Absolutely, dude. Thank Sounds you. Good. Thank you. Right. You got it. Later. All right.